as you said, it's really amazing how everything is kind of tied together today. And what I'm going to be talking to you about is the power of personal story. We've talked a lot about storytelling today. We've talked a lot about innovation. But what I want to talk to you about is basically the, po the personal story that lives right here within all of us. And what happens when you connect with that what happens when it transforms lives and brings about innovation? What if I were to give you this prompt? This is what you need to know about me to truly know me. What would you say? I can tell by some of your faces you know immediately what you tell me. And the other ones, I can, what you would tell me is basically you would share with me your story, the core of your being. And that core, that personal story, in every interaction that we have with other people, we're either trying to reveal a little bit of that story or desperately trying to hide it. I mean, even in the interactions we've had today, you're either trying to reveal it or hide it. And where you are in connecting with this personal story has everything to do with the way you do your job, the intimacy of your marriage, the depth of your friendships, even the way you parent your children. Where you are in connecting with the story might even be holding you back. So again, this prompt, this is what you need to know about me to truly know me. What would you say? I'll tell you what, I'll go first. My story. I was raised the fifth, fifth of six kids in a fundamentalist Baptist home my parents started churches in our living room, and they were big wigs in the Republican Party. I mean, I, there's no special place in my birth order. I was born smack dab between the black sheep of the family and the princess. My dad was a partner in a law firm, senior partner, and my mom started foundations, most of which she sat on the board, at, board on, so she was really busy. My parents were very prominent. And we were always in the newspaper, because all six of us were fairly athletic, so everybody knew us, and we were the perfect family. But what my mom's church friends and her country club friends didn't know is that she was physically and emotionally abusive. She used to make me kneel in front of her every time I misbehaved, and in a solemn voice, she'd close her eyes and ask the Lord to forgive me for disobeying her, and ask the Lord to help me learn how to obey her. It used to make me sick, and the hair on the back of my neck used to stand up and get all prickly. Our relationship was turbulent most of, most of my um, adulthood. I mean, after a particular very physical um, altercation that we had, I ran away from home in high school. I went to a college that she didn't approve of. She didn't speak to me the entire time I was there. I took a job after I graduated. Again, she didn't approve, and so she didn't actually help me plan my wedding. But in 1987, I came home for Christmas for the first time in three years. I hadn't spoken to her in three years. Because I was married, I had a newborn son, and I desperately wanted to have a relationship with my mom that so many of my friends did. You know, they went shopping together. I didn't know what that was like. And plus, I really missed my dad. I loved my dad. But when I got home, my dad was really sick, and my mom didn't seem to care. So I kept nagging her over and over again to do something. So she put him in the hospital, and after test after test was done, on January 7th, 1988, we found out my dad had full-blown AIDS. And if that wasn't enough to take in, three weeks later, we found out my mom also did. And my first thought? She had caused the whole thing. What was really going on is that my dad had been living a double life for 27 years, visiting bathhouses all over the country, keeping male lovers in apartments. Now think about this. This is 1988. The term safe sex hadn't been invented yet. The AIDS cocktail, a couple years on the horizon. In the state of Wisconsin where I was raised, there were 150 cases of full-blown AIDS. My mom was 150 and my dad was 149. Now, I knew not to tell people, because when I did, they shunned me. We had to move my dad out of state and change his name because we were being blackmailed by former lovers. We had to do the same with my mom, move her to the other side of town. 
I actually had a friend say to me, I can't be your friend anymore because you're not from a nice family. We would invite people over to have dinner at our house, and they would push their food around and not eat or drink anything the whole time. So I kept this story right here because I knew what would happen. Through this whole thing, my mom swore she would never forgive my dad. I mean, could you blame her? He had given her a death sentence and she was extremely difficult. But something started to change in her. And she started talking about this death row inmate by the name of Carla Faye Tucker. Do any of you remember her? She was on death row in the state of Texas for pickaxing two people to death. And it's still known as one of the grisliest crime in, in um, Texas. And she had also become one of those born-again Christians. Well, my mom couldn't say enough nice things about her. I mean, she would say, oh, she's just loves the Lord, and I would make fun of her. I mean, I had stuffed enough campaign, pro-death penalty campaign file um, brochures in the mailboxes my whole life. I'm like, whatever, Mom. But she started to change. She started saying things like, if I've ever done something to hurt you, I'm sorry. And three weeks before she died, she was actually visiting me at my house. And she was really frail. She couldn't get around without my helping her. And she was this big around. I mean, you, you all have seen pictures or even known people with AIDS. That was my mom. And she signaled for me to come over and, and sit by her on the couch, which is where she was spending most of her time, and I did. And with all the strength that she could muster, she lifted her hands up into my face, and she pulled my face right next to hers, and she said, you are so kind, and I love you. Now, after she died, I had to meet this Carla Faye Ducker because I wanted to know what she had done to change my mom. So I went to death row and the door was open and this woman starts running towards me. It's Carla Faye Tucker. She was about this big and she puts her arms around me and she gives me this great hug and she said, you're Diana, aren't you? Your mom has told me so much about you. I started crying right then, and I only had three hours with her that day, but that woman glowed. And she had a relationship with God I didn't know anything about. And at one point, in a puddle of my tears, I looked up at her and I said, you're so lucky. Because she was in prison and completely free. And I was walking around on the outside in a prison of my own making. Now fast forward four years, and when Carla Faye Tucker was executed, it was big news. And I just happened to mention to one of my, my editors, I knew her, and she said, you should write a first person about Carla Faye Tucker, and I said, yeah, I'll do it. And then it, I was hit with a dilemma, because I couldn't tell the story without telling the story. I mean, why else would I be in Texas visiting death row inmates? <laughs> so I wrote it, but I wrote it under a pseudonym. And it was passed off to another editor that I didn't know very well. And she basically said, why do you want to write it under a pseudonym? And I said, my mom has been through so much. We did so much healing. You know, and I don't want her and I don't want me to become fodder for gossip. And she said to me, you know, Diana, you've pretty much laid it all out here. There's nothing left to talk about. And so it went out to hundreds of thousands of people in the newspaper. And for the first time since 1988, I was free. The core of my story was revealed. And for the first time, I felt like I could accept not only the story, but I could be who I was. And I could accept myself, which allowed me to really understand what God's grace was all about, which really allowed me to accept others for who they were. And there were interesting things that happened, two really big innovations that happened in my life. The first was my writing changed. It didn't scare me to sit with people in pain, and most of, I was a healthcare reporter, and so most of what I was doing was covering people in crisis. And usually you would go in and tell a story, but it, I spent hours with these people and with my sources. And I realized that often I was the only one that was listening to them. Now, if any of you have had cancer or watched a parent die from Alzheimer's or any health crisis whatsoever, you know how it profoundly changes you. And really, I was the only one listening from start to finish to their stories. 
And I realized I was part of their healing process because nobody listens. The late author Scott Peck says that the ultimate act of love is listening because it really requires us to put ourselves in a bracket and put ourselves on the shelf to enter somebody else's life with no prejudice or no preconceived notions. We don't do that. We're basically ships passing in the night, never connecting and never really listening to one another. Innovation number two, I launched this website which allows people to tell their personal stories in a health and a wellness focus and lets others learn from their experience. When we were coming out of the gate, the first, the first story we did, and I was really second guessing, like, what are you doing? What's a nice print journalist doing in an internet company? We interviewed a family whose oldest daughter had been sexually molested. And the family had, was in crisis. They had four daughters. And the oldest daughter had cut herself drinking and had been sent away um, to a home. And the second daughter was an uh, alcoholic. And the third daughter was kind of following in the footsteps. And this family had tried to keep the secret so tight. And after this story aired, we, I got this letter from the mother. Diana, as you know, when I was being filmed, my three younger daughters were present, as was my husband. Unbeknownst to me, many of the things I had shared I had not shared before with my girls. They saw the tears and the pain and for the first time began to understand what the sexual abuse of my oldest daughter and their oldest sister really meant to our family unit. So many unanswered and unasked questions were now out in the open. I was very surprised that as my intention was to help others, that the most immediate healing I witnessed was in the faces of my younger girls. We hugged and cried and talked for days afterwards, and I finally asked them if they had any more questions, and they had tons. After our piece aired on the site, I received the gift of seeing how our story created open discussion. Yes, sexual abuse is such a taboo subject, and the shame that follows keeps us silent. Instead of feeling like a victim, my daughter who was abused, her three sisters, my husband and I began to feel like heroes of our lives. Up until that point, we hadn't realized how much we had triumphed. What's amazing is this couple is really involved in the International Justice Mission now. It's an organization that basically rescues women out of the sexual trade. And the daughter is actually um, going to be working with rape victims in Africa. They found their life mission because the story was revealed and they had no more hiding to do. We're all craving intimacy. I mean, without exception in this room, the cry of every heart is to be known and once known, truly loved. I mean, it's really the way that we're wired. And once that happens, a life is transformed and innovation takes place, and then anything is possible. So I'm going to ask you again. I'm going to show you this prompt. This is what you need to know about me, to truly know me. What would you say? You want to get to know somebody? Ask them this. Thank you.